Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hi. Our today's keynote will be held by Professor Dr. Spitzer, who is also a member of our Board of Governors. He studied, he studied medicine, psychiatry, and philosophy at the University of Freiburg. He did, he did his diploma in psychiatry and his PhD in philosophy and medicine, and is a professor of psychiatry. He was a professor at the University of Oregon and Harvard. He currently teaches at the, the University of Ulm. We're very glad he's here today, and without further ado, I would like to ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Spitzer to the stage. Good afternoon. Let me first thank the organizers for having me here. I'm glad I can speak to so many people from so many different countries and backgrounds. And um, the problem might be that I am, uh, tend to talk fast about uh, some subjects that you may have never heard about with a funny German accent in my English. And that all doesn't contribute to understandability. But I hope I'll make it and I hope you'll, you'll get the ideas that I'm uh, trying to convey. This talk is going to be on the brain, as I'm a brain researcher, and it's going to be your brain. And, um, uh, and it's uh, your journey, and uh, we'll talk about journeys a bit, and, um, uh, and it may, most of all about your brain's journey from being born to now. But let me just start off showing a few brains. Um, the right one, and it's it's, it's a, the, these are brain scans that are routinely done in the clinic, and uh, the right one looks quite normal, and uh, the left one doesn't look so normal. And um, uh, the left one could be your brain, actually. And the reason I'm saying this is because uh, the, the, the left brain that doesn't look too good has been published for one single reason. The reason is that the person who belongs to this brain doesn't have any symptoms. He's just fine. So from the fact that you are feeling fine, you couldn't infer that you don't have the brain on the left side. You could have that, okay. And the first question that I wanna discuss with you briefly is how can this be? How can there be 80% gone in a brain without anybody noticing, including the person or other persons. It's basically, it's a 33-year-old French civil servant married with two children, functioning fine, okay, with only 20% of the brain left. If I cut out a hole in this machine, I think we all agree it would no longer work. In fact, computers, as you all know, they have a, a funny way of working. They, Sometimes just they quit. And if they stop functioning, they do so, well, very abruptly, in that they just stop. And we have a, a funny vocabulary. We say, it crashed. It hung up. It hung itself up. Kind of suicidal. Brains have just the opposite feature. And the technical terms called graceful degradation. So if they hang up, they do this very gracefully. So for example, if you lose neurons in your brain in certain diseases, you often start noticing when 70% of the diseased neurons are already gone. And then you start noticing something. That's just how brains gracefully um, give up what they are supposed to do. How can this be? What's in here, everyone knows, in here is a CPU, a central processing unit, and a hard drive. The unit, the CPU, does the information cr number crunching and the processing, and the hard drive does the storage. What's in here? 100 billion of these things. You have all seen these things, and this, this is called a neuron or a nerve cell, and you have, again, 100 billion in your, in your head, okay? And you all have heard that they are working electrically, they signal to one another with little electrical signals. So they have lots of connections. 
The number of connections, well you see here a cell very closely and you see a few dozen connections. But the number of connections of each cell in your brain is about 10,000. That's quite a number. So if you, given that you have 100 billion neurons and 10,000 connections each, that makes the number of connections in your brain 10,000 times 100 billion. That's 1 million billion. That's a one with 15 zeros. That's the number of the connections, these connections in your brain. And when I was a student, uh, I once asked the professor when we learned about the workings of this thing, it's called a synapse, you all know that. And we learned about, you know, receptors and neurotransmitters and ion channels and all that. And I asked the professor, why is this thing there in the first place? Why don't we have just a cable connecting the one neuron to the other neuron? And the cable would actually be faster. The cable wouldn't take as much energy as all this biochemistry that's going on in the synapse. So without the synapse, it would be first faster and it would take up less energy. So it would be much more efficient. Why a synapse? When I was a student back then, the answer was, shut up. Really, it was not nice and, um, um, and I realized that that was the wrong question and um, well, it, of course it was the right question but the professor didn't know the answer either. And the reason for this was that nobody back then knew the answer which was of course most shamefully for the professor who worked on synapses all day. That's why for him that was embarrassing not to know why, what they are for. And by now we know what synapses are for. Again, you all have one million billion synapses in your head, like these. So why is that? Well, that's the biggest breakthrough in the neurosciences over the last 30 or 40 years that we do know by now. This came out in 1999. They managed to photograph two synapses. On the one on the left, only a few signals went through this synapse and the one on the right, lots of signals went through it. That's why it looks different. Again, 10 years later, they managed to make an image of a part of a neuron. So we are, just, just think of any of these branches, okay? And you look at the same thing four days later and you notice changes. A red arrow means that there's something new and the blue arrow means there's something missing. So what you see here is uh, the turnover of connections in your brain on a day-to-day -day basis. We see if you count them in eight days, eight errors, uh, that means that we have eight changes in eight days. That means a change per day at a part of a single neuron of which you have in your brain a hundred billion. That gives you the roughly the idea of what change you have per day in your brain. That's a lot. Do you notice? Probably not. But it happens. And more than 300 years ago the German philosopher Leibniz, he invented calculus. What do you do in calculus? Well you add ever more stuff that gets ever smaller until the number of the stuff that you add is infinite and uh, it is infinitely small and you get a result. That's the interesting thing. Leibniz, who invented this, together with Newton, they did it independently and then they had a quarrel who did what, but they, don't, they both did it. Um, but Leibniz was clever enough that he thought, well, this is also how the brain works. There is a lot of stuff going on and we don't notice anything of that going on but you get a result of that. And the, the sum of all these results, that's the person you. That was Leibniz 300 years ago. So he talked about unconscious processing. A lot happens, you don't know. He talked about that it leaves a trace. We call this a memory trace. He says that, that if you do something with your brain, it changes your brain. Whatever you perceive, think, feel, anything what you do with your brain, it changes the brain. Again, he thought that out 300 years ago. Now we know he was, all, he was completely right. 
even though he didn't, he didn't know that neurons exist. He just knew there is a brain. That's about it. But he had clever ideas how it might work back then, of which we know now he was completely right back then. And the interesting thing is, so what, what is this for, this changing, the re removal and adding on of you know, connections? Why is this? Well, at day nine in this experiment, they started to train the animal to learn something and they know, well, we know how in the brain of the animal things are organized. So they took a task of which was known that it was exactly performed where the hole in the brain was made to make these pictures. So now you're looking at this part of the brain when the animal started to learn on day nine and now look at changes that happened on, until day 12 and what you see is red arrows, that is new connections have formed. And on day 16, that's when the animal stopped learning, you see again new connections and it, this is just an exemplary image but they, they took the count of the new connections and also the, the removed connections over a greater area and they found that it went hand in hand with the learning process. So whenever you learn something, what you basically do is you form new connections in your brain. And again, that all these connections you formed up to now make you you, make you the person that you are. And this is also a minor point is you are your brain. You not just have a brain, you are your brain. You, you are not your kidney, which is why I can't take the kidney out and put another one in and it's still you. To take your heart out and put another one in, it's still you. But think about a brain transplant. That's the only transplant uh, where you rather like to be the donor and not the recipient. <laughs> because if you get a new brain transplant, then the donor looks into the mirror next day after the operation and just uh, wonders that he just looks different in the mirror. And you are gone, okay? The donor's brain lives on in your body. So you are your brain. You don't have a brain, just as you have a heart or a kidney. The brain makes you, you. That's an important insight. And you became you by living your life up to now. That was your journey, your life journey. That changed the connections in your brain. For example, you came into existence at birth. You came with a brain that contained motor centers, but you couldn't walk. You couldn't use your motor centers, but you tried. So you pulled yourself up eventually, and then you fell down again, and you pulled yourself up again, and you fell down again, and you do this a couple of thousand times, and the brain figures out how many signals to send to which muscles to stay upright. First a bit, not so good, and, and it gets better and better, okay? You learned how to talk, how is that done? Well, same thing. People talk to you. And your brain is not a tape recorder. Your brain is much cleverer than a, than a tape recorder because your brain learns the general words with their general meanings and with general rules how to build sentences with words. That's grammar. So you learn words, semiotics, grammar, and then all of a sudden you can speak. That is, you can use that and speaking is not about, you know, regurgitating whatever you heard, but forming new sentences to, well, talk, say new things. And again, your brain did that when you were really young. Your brain get, it doesn't get programmed. It, it learns. And it does so by itself. Without a teacher, we learn the most important things in life. To walk, to talk, that this is a table and this is a microphone, etc., etc., what the world is about. And when you go to school, when you start go to school, you, you, you've learned the basics without a teacher. Your brain did that. And my language centers didn't know German when I was born, but they have processed German whereby they, they got connections that form the basis of me being capable of speaking German. And the interesting thing is, that happens very early, and it happens best very early. 
That's why this brain on the right side I've shown you already, okay? That's why this brain is possible. Uh, and to make sure that you get the idea, uh, the, the brain in the middle, that was a German truck driver, 51, and he didn't have any symptoms too. He, was, he just got a scan coincidentally and it knocked the doctors off their chair because if, it, if you show the middle image to a radiologist, the radiologist will tell you this man is dead. What do you, what do you want with this image? There's no, no way to live with such, with half, with your frontal brain gone. And uh, the, the left, most left image is the most famous one. It got published 16 years ago. The girl, this is, a, is the brain of a seven year old girl. And the girl uh, had an infection in the left brain and it threatened to go to the right. So they, they decided upon a very radical therapy. They took out half of the girl's brain. They operated and took out half of the brain. Just took it out. Now, what's, what sits here? The control of the, the other side of the body. So you would expect the girl is hemiplegic. It's in wheel, he, she's in wheelchairs. What sits here, uh, what else? Well, the language centers, motor, sensory. So the girl not only is in wheelchairs, she doesn't talk and doesn't understand. So she's severely impaired, mentally and physically. In fact, the girl has nothing. She, and the, the write-up of her examination at age seven is, well, she jumped into the doctor's office without even limping a bit. And she was speaking two languages fluently, Turkish and Dutch, without language centers in her brain. Think about what you can do with language centers, by the way. If you can do two languages easily at the age of seven without any language centers. If you and I would, would suffer from any of this now, we'd drop dead in the right and middle case and we'd be severely impaired in the left case. But if you get this when you are one, two or three and you're lucky and you get, well, rehab and all that, you don't notice anything in a couple of years thereafter. That's the amazing thing that brains can do. So they, they can completely rewire themselves, but only at a young age, because they can learn so fast. This graph has been produced by a Nobel Prize winning economist. And uh, Jim Hackman, he was um, uh, writing up a paper which was published in Science eight years ago, where he thought about the return of the investment in human capital. That is, if you want to spend a dollar on education, at what age do you spend the, the dollar best? And the answer is at kindergarten age. As you can see from this curve, okay, this the rate of uh, return of investment in human capital. School age is not too bad either. Uh, after post school, well, it's the return of investment is quite low. And the reason is simple, because brains learn fast in kindergarten, they still learn rather quickly in school and, uh, well, not so much so after school. Before you get depressed by figuring out that you're almost in the green area, <laughs> let me tell you that this is only half of the truth. And in fact, it's an important half. Because of, because of this curve, we, we send children to school and adolescents, not retired people. Okay, it makes more sense to send young people to the schools, to the learning institutions, because they learn faster. But again, it's only half the truth. The other half, interestingly in, enough, you know, you just don't know that you know. So let me bring it out. Here's two, two German people, let's say in their 40s both. So they're way down, you know, in the green area. So they are 40 and they, this guy knows German. And this guy knows German and four more languages. Now both start to learn a new language. 
who, would do, who, who can do this better? Who thinks this guy can learn better? Who thinks this guy can learn better? Well, the, the majority is right. This guy is better at learning a new language. He knows five already. Let's take musical instruments. This guy knows nothing. This guy knows five instruments. They both start a new instrument. Who can do this better? Well, this guy again. A new tool. No tools, five tools or 20 tools already in the workshop down in the basement and a new tool comes up and so they both buy it and try, try it out and who, who does it better? Well, this guy. A math book. This guy never read a math book. This read 10 math books. Now a new math book comes up and they both read it. Who, who gets more out of this read? Well, again this. Isn't that interesting? Have you ever met somebody who says, you know, I, I know six languages. By now my language centers are full. <laughs> no. In fact, you'd laugh at the person because um, we all know the more languages you know, the easier it is to learn another one. There are people who know 50 languages. They learn the 51st in six weeks. In fact, if you know 50 languages, uh, if you took as long as everybody learns the mother tongue, that is from birth to schooling, that's six years. With 50 languages, that, that would take 300 years. So you can't do it the same way, you know? You have to be faster. But isn't that interesting? The more languages you know, the easier it is to learn another one. And that not, that's not just the case for languages. That's the case for anything. Look, the hard drive in here, if it's 50% full, it has 50% capacity left. And if it's 90% full, it has 10% capacity left. This thing functions quite differently. It has the capability, the odd capability, the more is in there, the more you can still fit in there. That's the, that, that's the interesting thing. And again, you laughed at somebody who says, my language centers are full, I, I know six languages. So you knew that, but you didn't know that you knew it. Uh, which is why, by the way, that you can read in the newspapers every day such nonsense like, well, the digital natives, they outsource mental capabilities, which is why they can learn other stuff. This is utter nonsense. Whenever you out, let's, let's say you outsourced English so far in order to learn Chinese when you were 20. It doesn't make any sense. You don't learn Chinese easier by not having learned English before. But you are actually impaired if you want to learn Chinese not knowing another language first, before that. Okay. So the, the hard drive metaphor doesn't work for your brain. In fact, it's bad advice. Because you say, oh no, I don't learn this because I want to save up space for later. <laughs> no, this is just not how the brain works, okay? That is, whatever you have not learned in, well, preschool and school is not, is not going to be helpful when you are a grown up in learning. Many people talk these days about lifelong learning and how do we achieve that? The answer is very simple. We achieve that by learning a lot in school. And if you're done, and if you're 20, and you have a lot of connections in your brain, and you have learned a couple of languages and a lot of other stuff, then you can learn for your lifetime, easily. And of course, another thing goes with this insight. If you haven't learned much when you are 20, not much fits in there because you don't have the capability to hook new things, connect the new things to the old stuff that's already here. If you have a well-trained language center and you, and you know five languages, your chances, if you see people in a dialogue and you don't know what the language they're talking, that you, that you get a little bit here and there and from there you can work your way in understanding these people. Well, the more languages you know, the easier this task is for you. That is, the easier you'll learn the next, the next language. That is, the more is in there, the easier it is for you to learn. That's the most important insight for all of you who are still in the, uh, well, in the blue area, okay?
you can still take care of your future in that you learn a lot now in order to be able to learn even more later. Because that's how the brain works. And again, you are bombarded by an industry who wants to sell you stuff uh, with other ideas. For example, well, you don't need to know much today. You can Google anything. That's utter nonsense. Because if you know nothing, well, you don't Google in the first place because you have no question. <laughs> and if you know a bit, Google is useless. And I have a very good case uh, from, from my field. You know Morbus Google? Google sickness? What's that? Well, actually, that's not my invention. Uh, Microsoft engineers came up with this in the 2009. And they looked at the use of da databases, uh, general databases, general search engines, and medical databases. And they found this. If you Google headache, it takes you one point no, 0 0.1 seconds to get to brain tumor. And if you Google muscle twitching, you realize you, 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 you Googled that, you, you, in 0 0.1 seconds, you are told that you'll live another year and you have Lou Gehring's disease or, well, Stephen Hawking's disease, and it's a deadly disease, okay? If you go to a medical database, that doesn't happen, but people don't go to medical databases because they are cumbersome to use because you have to know what you're doing. And if you know nothing and you Google headache or twitching, uh, you know you're dead soon, basically. <laughs> and of course, this is what happens now. People go to their doctors and they, they learn a diagnosis. They, they are completely emotionally overwhelmed by this. The doctor has no time anyway, so people walk home. On the way home, they, they come up with all these questions they should have asked the doctor. And so they say, well, I, I can Google things. And they Google on average for one and a half hours, after which they are completely not so well anymore mentally. <laughs> Next day, they go to, the, to another doctor to get a second opinion. Uh, they go to a psychiatrist or psychologist. They get some, uh, some calming down pills or some sleeping pills. And that, by now, costs our healthcare system a significant amount of money. Really, that has been studied. You can Google Morbus Google and you find that. <laughs> how, how do you avoid this? It's very simple to avoid it. If you Google in the realm of medicine, it really helps if you studied medicine before. And you can do that. I can Google in medicine, sure, because I know to sort the wheat from the chaff when I get all these 10,000 hits on my screen. And people who don't know medicine, they can't. And there's no way to do that unless you know medicine. Most importantly, there is no general capability to sort out truth from non-truth we don't have that. Even we have words for that capability. It's called media literacy, media competency, uh, internet driver's license, and, and all, all these. We have all these names that suggest that there is something that, about the internet that you can know, and once you know it, you can Google anything. This is just not true. Of course, you have to know how to think, logical and and or and not. You have to, f to, to know these ideas. And we learn them quite early, actually. And then you have to have knowledge in a given field. And then you can Google within that field where you know things. So the more you know in a certain area, the better you can use search engines within this area. There's no doubt about that. Which is why you cannot replace knowledge with Google. There's no way. Out there is not knowledge. There's information. In order to access it, you have to have knowledge. And it has to be in here. And knowledge is not road facts. Knowledge is always a network. And it's also always usable. So when you know something, you can use that. For example, when you use the search engine to find out what's right and wrong in the hits that the search engine gives you. You can often you can apply it to practical problems, etc., etc. But that's what, what knowledge is about. 
Okay, and again, out there is no knowledge. People sometimes talk about the world knowledge out there in the cloud. No, out there is information. In order for you to make this information work for you, you have to apply your knowledge to use this information, to integrate it into your knowledge and then to apply it. No way around this, which is why you cannot have what people have sometimes called knowledge on demand. I'm covering here a lot of ground and a lot of ground that while you may have come across reading about the digital age. And people say, well, now we have the knowledge economy. And just like in the real stuff economy, um, where you don't have warehouses where you store, let's say, the wheels for a car. No, the wheels for the Porsche that are produced in Germany are, are delivered the very second where the wheels are screwed to the car. And so we need no warehouses, which is why we have lean production, that's how it's called, and so we have a cheap production. And now the idea goes, and this is exactly how we have to deal with knowledge. Knowledge storing in your mind, that was yesterday. Today we have knowledge on demand. So whenever you need it, you Google it and then you know it. This is utter nonsense. Think about the doctor taking out, let's say, an appendix, cutting off the belly and start, what's there? Well, let's Google it. <laughs> That's not the way to do this, okay? You apply knowledge in order to get things done, and that's knowledge in here. Or take a person who goes to England. Well, with a booklet with all the English vocabulary. That's knowledge on demand. So if you put this booklet into your pocket and you go to England, well, and you have this knowledge on demand. But if you don't know English, it's useless. It's completely useless. There was an EU research project funded by a couple of millions about knowledge on demand. That's like having a research project on elves and unicorns. There is no such thing as a unicorn. So it's hard to do, a, let's say, a biological research grant on unicorns, okay? You can do the, the, the history of unicorns in the literature, yes, sure, but you, I mean real unicorns and uh, how's their physiology working, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's, that you wouldn't do that. But they did this with knowledge on demand. It tells you how strange people misunderstand themselves sometimes. They think it's possible to have knowledge on demand, which, in fact, is not. That's an important thing to realize. It's what you know, your knowledge, that enables you to deal with all the stuff that's out there. And the more you know, the better you can do that. And there's no way not to have this personal knowledge, which is why schools tell you all kinds of things, chemistry, biology, and history, and, and geography, and who knows what. Because that helps you to understand, well, whatever you want to understand when you're grown up. And you will have to understand a lot because you will have to solve a lot of problems. And the number of problems actually increases, um, as you all, I, I'm sure, you know. In fact, this curve is quite nonspecific. For a brain researcher, it looks a little more like this. That is, your perceptual system is done when you're five. As a corollary to this, you can no longer teach your perceptual system new tricks after five. Which is why if you come, if you're born with a 70% seeing eye and 100% seeing eye, and you just do nothing, what happens? Well, the visual centers, they like sharp images. So the images from this 100% seeing eye, they will be processed by the visual centers, and they don't like the blurry images from here, they won't process them. In fact, the good images will suppress the processing of the images that come from this eye. Now think of the blue arrows I've shown you in a couple of slides before. This is removed connections because of non-use. Well, if you just do nothing, when the kid is five, this eye is blind because it just hasn't been used. And the problem is it, it's going to stay blind for the rest of the life of the person. So what do we do? 
Well, eye doctors know for a long time if you find in a baby by you know, trying out, holding one eye, shutting one eye, and then looking at if it follows your fingers, and you can do vision tests with babies, not like, you know, start from the reading the stuff from above, but, but you can do with the vision tests with babies. And then you can do objective vision tests these days with machines that record brain potentials upon images, etc., etc. And if you find a baby has a 70% seeing eye and a 100% seeing eye, do you know what you do? You patch up the good eye for a couple of days, for a couple of hours every day until the kid is five. Which is, by the way, not fun, neither for the kid nor for the mother who usually does the patching. Because kids don't like to get their good eye patched up and then they have to look at, to, to do with a blurry image for a couple of hours a day. But if you do it, and if you succeed as a mother to patching up the good eye of your kid a few hours a day, you save this eye, this 70% seeing eye, because if the brain just has the blurry images from this eye, it processes them without the competition from here. So the connections, by their use, are preserved, the ones that are already there, and new connections are formed because this pathway is used. And by the age of five, you can leave the patch because as this curve indicates, the visual system is done. And you have preserved everything that was at birth just by patching up the good eye. We do know by now that um, it, with, uh, with language, it takes longer, but if you haven't learned to speak or even sign language, any language at the age of 13, you're no longer going to learn any language. That's that. So that's the, the, the time frame in which the language system has to, has to learn. Well, with the thought, volition, action, that, everything we do with our frontal areas that mature at the latest, this thing is up and running when you're born. Language not. It starts running and, and learning a bit later. This thing develops until you are about 25. But then it's done. Which is why, by the way, the Catholic Church knows for centuries that at the age of 26, to be a missionary no longer is useful. Because if, if, if you want to convert somebody to Christianity, the person has to be below 26. At 26, your value systems, your customs, your habits, etc., everything that sits in the front lobes is basically done. So you cannot make a Buddhist into a Christian after 26, or if so, it's very hard to do, and it's probably not real, a real conversion, but a conversion by lip service or whatever. Again, that's what the Catholic Church says about frontal lobe development, and um, from a brain perspective, they are quite right on target. Um, we know that the frontal lobes develop until 23, 24, 25, and then they're done. Okay. And they're good for the rest of your life. And as I said, the language centers being done by 13 doesn't mean you can't learn another language at 13. No, but you have to have learned at least one in order to use this thing. Same thing with this eye. You can see new stuff with this eye until you're 85 or, or 95. But it has to be up and running. And, you, and, and the, the first five years, make it up and running and make it work. You get the idea why I call this the journey of your life, okay? It's you. You made this. You, you managed to learn how to walk and to talk and to see and to hear at anything. And I hope by now to want something, to carry through an action. This is the frontal function. Your willpower, how do you learn that? Some philosophers have said it's impossible to learn because I already need to have it in order to use it. Nonsense. You sing a song. That is, you have the idea of the song. And then you set action in motion and you sing and you follow a certain sequence of notes that you sing. And afterwards, when you're done, you're proud of yourself having sung that song. 
And if you're seeing in a choir, or at least with two, you have to start at the same time point and you have to end at the same time point, which is even trickier than just singing on your own, but it's even more fun. Or you can play soccer, then you have to follow rules. And play only works if there are rules to follow. R ruleless play doesn't exist. It's always let's play, well, cowboy and uh, Indian, or let's play policeman and, uh, and uh, robber, or let's play mom and dad, uh, or mother and child. Whenever, whatever you play, there are rules that you follow. And that's the fun thing about the play. And what do you learn when you play, sing a song, or climb a tree? Yes, you learn how to play and sing a song or climb a tree, but the most important thing is you learn to exercise your willpower. And if you have done this a thousand of times, then you can carry things out and carry things through. You can make your thing, which is a capability that's more important for the rest of your life than your IQ. IQ is important. The, the higher your IQ, the, well, the more you, you will earn. It has a clear correlation. The, 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 more, the higher your education will be, etc., etc. But again, IQ is in, in, the, the effect of IQ is, is a bit lower than the effect of your willpower. And your willpower, well, you're not born with it. You have to use it in order to get it. Like language, like walking, like anything else that you do with your brain. In fact, there is no such a thing as raw IQ. I sometimes meet people who say, well, you know, I'm, I'm a really gifted person. I just don't make anything out of it. That's like a person saying, I'm really a sports person. I just happen to have laid in bed for the last three years. <laughs> But you know, I'm really good at sports. I um, uh, can't do it now, of course, because my muscles have wasted away because I haven't used them. But I'm really sportive. Well, it's nonsense. And just as it is nonsense to have laid three years in bed, have not used your muscles, and to, 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 to claim you are real sportive is not having used your brain and claim you are really gifted. You are really bright, you just don't show it. If you haven't learned anything, well, you're not going to be bright, period. And good, good genes for a high IQ are just as useless for being bright as good muscular genes are if you don't train your muscles, period. That's a very important insight. Because, to tell you the truth, I'm a psychiatrist. The world is full of highly gifted underachievers. They're really gifted, but they never tried it out. So the, so the funny thing is, that's the way to claim you're really gifted until you retire, is not to use all your gifts. So you can say, well, I could have, and then I would have been the greatest, but I just didn't want to. Of course, you're still the greatest, at least in your own imagination. Which is, well, you, you may laugh, but this is, actually, this is, this is a, a life history of many people. Okay, I could have, but I haven't. This is, by the way, it's not the way to become happy in your life. Um, just to, to make this remark. If you, if, if, if you happen to be among those people who want to lead a happy life, some people belong to this class of people. Um, not, not all. Again, as a psychiatrist, I can tell you. Um, well, then do something. Do something with your life in order to, well, to do your journey. And uh, don't, don't waste it, which is really important. When you use your brain, the yellow curve results. The yellow curve is basically brain training and how well your brain works. And the more you, you do for training, for example, you speak two languages. Your brain is more up to speed than if you speak just one. We know that for quite some time, actually for nine years. Only for nine years. And you get really higher, and the, the important thing is this. Eventually, when you get old, or when you get some brain diseases, your brain will go down. 
as you can see the, by the end of the, the, the curve. How do we call this? Down with our mind. Down, Latin is D, and mind is mens. We ne the technical term is dementia. Dementia is not a diagnosis, it's just a description. Down with your mind. But the important thing is this. If you go down, and this is true for any going down, the higher you start, the longer it takes you to get down. So if you have a really highly developed brain, let's say the yellow curve is, is, is way up, and you start going down, well, you're still high up. So if you're really well developed in your brain and your neurons die, well, you will go down, but fr start from very high. And you will get your dementia when you get, a, get to 150. You don't get to 150, so you die earlier. But you don't get your dementia this way because you die before you get it. Simply because you're so high up. And if you don't believe me, let me give you the example. Sister Mary, she died at 101. And she was a teacher until she was 84. And then she taught, she continued teaching, but inofficially. And she was tested shortly before she died. Um, she didn't have any dementia. In the tests, the same tests that we use in my hospital to figure out if somebody has dementia or not. Sister Mary didn't suffer from dementia. And then she was dead and her brain was examined and the brain of Sister Mary was full of Alzheimer's. You can have a brain full of Alzheimer's, that is, full of stuff that doesn't belong here, that stuff that, that uh, junk in your head, and full of dead neurons, okay? Sister Mary's brain was full of dead neurons and junk, but she wasn't suffering from dementia in tests. Why? Her brain was very highly developed. At young age, actually, she was very bright at 20. And so she, she had a very highly developed brain. And then she got down. And she would have get, gotten dementia at 130 or 40 or 50. And she didn't because, well, she died at 101. Alzheimer's, by the way, it's just one form of your brain going down. You can have infarctions. You can have all kinds of things that wreck your brain. Alzheimer's is just the most, most common thing. What do you think? How old was the youngest person in whom Alzheimer's was found in the brain? Six years. In your brain, there may already be a lot of Alzheimer's. Did you know that? It doesn't matter if you are really well trained. Okay, that's my point. The better you're trained, the, 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 the later you, the, the, the Alzheimer's onset is going to be. And just to give an example, you know this little green arrow at the beginning of this, of this on, the, on the left of this graph, it says bilingualism. So if you speak two languages, what do we know? Well, we know that your brain is more developed because you use two languages. And if you continue using the two languages, you have extra training. And when you get dementia, you get it five years later. Full five years later for just being bilingual. By the way, if you know three, lingu uh, three languages, that doesn't give you 10 years. It also gives you just five. Um, <laughs> We have understood the mechanism, but we, and, and again, we have not just one study showing this. By now, we have seven. The oldest is from 2007, and the, the newest is from last year. Seven studies showing five more years. By the way, the best medications we have against dementia give you another three months. That's nothing compared to just speaking another language. That gives you five years. And now look at the graph. If you use your hands a lot, digit is not only finger, it also means number. And there's a reason for this, because the numbers get into our brain by using our hands. And the more finger play you do in kindergarten, the better you are at math at age 20. We know that. Well, because there's, the brain deals better with, well, is more dexterous with fingers and numbers. 
by, and you train this not by giving out tablets in kindergarten where they do this, that is do useless, a useless motion with the finger, okay? And by the way, the, the, always the same motion no matter what's on the tablet, okay? That doesn't train anything in your brain. If I give a four-year-old um, the task of, you know, taking something in the hand or whatever, the kid will do that. But if the four-year-old has only done this, no way. That's an important thing. So you're not going to be clever by using a tablet in kindergarten. That's an important insight uh, to have. Tablets are not good for the development of your brain as, as, as any digital media are not. Particularly, at, and the younger you are, the more disastrous they are. There is a group of people who actually may use digital information technology and not suffer from it, but even maybe benefit a bit. Who is that? The retired people. They really, they, they benefit from a computer. And of course, people who work with computers, they, they, th there's no problem with this. I'm a scientist and a doctor. I couldn't do my work without computers. That's sure, for sure. But there are risks and side effects of, uh, well, outsourcing the mental, as I, as I said to you, and uh, using too much computers, it's not good. Um, for example, if you give out smartphones, students' grades go down. If you stop use smartphones in schools, grades go up. That's, no, that's known by now, okay? So we should be careful about smartphones, period. And as you can easily see, there's a lot uh, as, as regards digital media that uh, can do a lot of harm. I'm um, not going into this because I think I have um, more and uh, other interesting stuff to tell you. For example, you don't want that. It was on the. It was on this. You know, stress multitasking. Look at the uh, on the on the arrow, the red arrow. That's not good for you. How how can I say this? Why? Well, first of all, what is what is stress? Stress is an emergency response. You press one button, you get max energy, max cardiovascular output, max brain power now. And that's really helpful if, uh, well, the lion is after you. <laughs> and digestion, growth, immune defense, and reproduction, you can do later if the lion's right after you. So, and the nice thing about the stress re response is that this is exactly what your body is doing when you are stressed. You walk across a frozen lake and you break in. Thinking about reproduction is not a good idea. <laughs> okay. You want to mobilize energy. You want to get out of this trouble. Okay. Which is why you have a stress response when you break in, when you walk on thin ice. Okay. And this stress response is really handy. The problem is, if you have stress responses all the time, okay, all the time you, you, you have high blood pressure and lots of energy, that is, that's called hypertension and diabetes. And that's exactly what you get if you have stress all the time. And if you dampen down your stomach, you get ulcers when you do this all the time. And if you dampen down growth, your bone density goes down and you will get fractures eventually. If you dampen down your immune system, you will not only get infections, you will get cancer because in your body, right now, cancer comes into existence. But thank goodness your immune system catches these cells and um, that was that. But if you dampen down your immune system, chances are that some cancerous cells that come into existence in your body all the time make it and they get a hold someplace and then they grow and that's, that was that with your life. So chronic stress is the worst thing you can have. Now let's look at how to get chronic stress. This is a nice little setup that has been used for decades now to study stress. Two animals in two cages, and they have a, a metal bottom such that you can have electroshocks 
going to the cages that are painful. And the box is set up such that randomly it generates electric shocks. And one animal just gets the shocks. The other animal has a little light and a switch. And if the light, and the, 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 the whole thing is programmed such that the light goes on just a moment before the shock goes on. And if this animal then presses the button, the shock will not come. The animal can switch out the shock. And as the shock machine is connected to both cages, in this case, both animals don't get the shock. So now you have two animals and you can set this up such that most of the time the right animal gets it. But sometimes it's just too slow, okay, and then both get the shock. Now you can measure stress hormone. You can also count ulcers when you leave it for a few weeks uh, running. Uh, you can count high blood pressure. You can, you can monitor tumors. You can do whatever you want and you will find something interesting. There's only one of the animals that gets all the stress responses. So which animal has the stress? Who says the one on the upper left? Hands up. Who says stressed is the one on the lower right? Hands up. Well, in this case, the majority is always wrong. <laughs> to the right animal, the world looks quite all right. Well, sometimes this light goes up. And if I'm fast enough, nothing happens. Okay, sometimes I'm a bit slow, then I get a shock. Well, I deserve it, I was too slow. That's kind of the thought of the right animal. And the left animal, no matter what I do, sometimes I get this painful shock. And that's what causes chronic stress. Stress is not the amount of objective adversity there is. Stress is the subjective feeling, I can't do anything about it. Okay, That's the most important insight you can have about stress. Stress is not objective adversity. It's the feeling of lack of control about the adversity. You know, if you have a boss, every Monday he is not so well off and shouts at you. You can deal with that, but if the boss is like the weather and shouts at you just sometimes and you don't know why, that's much more stressful to you. Same thing uh, with your wife. <laughs> Boys, listen. If you get married, you live about five years longer. Because company buffers stress, the deadliest disease is not heart attack, is not cancer. This came out in this study of over 300,000 people. The deadliest disease is being lonely. So you, you see here how deadly things are. Air pollution is the, the smallest bar down there. So uh, yes, air pollution is deadly. I mean, it kills you, but it kills you to this amount. Um, being obese kills you, that's, that's the second, for, for the, the third from, from below. And then if you do sports, it's good for you. And, um, and if you don't do sports, it's bad for you. You can read the chart both ways. So what is, what is, what is the biggest bar? It's being lonely. Or being in company gives you so much more life and not being in company raises your mortality by so much. The biggest killer in the Western societies is loneliness. And the reason is, if you're lonely, well, you live more insecurely than if you have company. Because if, you've, if, if you are part of a network, then you can have a disease, you can, get, you can lose your job, you can lose your, 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 your apartment. There will be somebody t t care, taking care of you. And if you are just on your own, not. Which is why that has been shown in, in this paper, it's a brain research paper. The better your social network is, the lower your stress hormone level in your blood. Company buffers stress, which is why it's good for you. By the way, women don't live longer when they are married. Um, <laughs> 
Maybe because boys are more stressful. Uh, <laughs> Science is not, is, is not done with this question, but it's just a matter of fact. But men, again, live five years longer on average. But let me, boys, let me tell you this. If your wife is emotionally unstable, <laughs> you die seven years earlier. <laughs> so that you lose seven years with the wrong person that you marry, okay? So shy away from the emotionally uh, unstable women, they are d deadly. <laughs> they say you learn for life, not for the school, and now you know um, what this is about, okay? Um, I want you to have a long journey, and I'm talking about your journey. So now you know about stress. And which is why you want to be, you want to be in control of your life. You don't let anybody else take control. That's the life insurance that you can do on your own. Just say, I am in control. And if you happen not to be in control, then get out of the situation to be in control. And then you will live a long life, period. It sounds simple, let me tell you, it isn't. But you can, you can try and you can make right or wrong decisions in this way. I gave you an example with regards to marriage and there are others. Well, we had not only stress in this graph with a yellow curve, we also had multitasking. Why is this? People say we have to do this now because we have to use all kinds of things at the same time. Well, multitasking, by the way, is not when I jump and wave and talk. I could do this now for a couple of minutes or until I, I won't, but that wasn't multitasking. Why? Because hopping is completely automatic, waving is automatic, and then there was one task left that I had to think about, that was talking. Multitasking, by its very nature, is this. You follow two streams of meaning, that is, two phone calls at the same time two TV shows at the same time. Well, if they are meaningless, you can, but uh, let's say meaningful things. Did you ever see somebody reading two books at the same time to be faster? <laughs> no. And the reason is, and this is, this is you know, in, in psychology, they worked this out 20, 30 years ago. You just cannot do this. People cannot process two streams of information at the same time. There's no way. Even women can't do it. <laughs> Sometimes it's claimed they can, but they can't. Okay. There's a reason why right now here, there's not a second talk over there. <laughs> it, it would not make sense. Okay. So as, when it comes to multitasking, don't. That's, that's the simplest thing to, 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 to say. And in fact, if you say, oh, well, I, I try and I train myself to do it. They have done this and they have tested people who said, I can do multitasking well. It turns out they can do everything that they claim that they can do worse than non-multitaskers. So they train themselves to be inattentive, basically. So when you multitask, you, you have a, 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 a non optimal way of using your mind, and if you do this a lot, you train yourself to use your mind in a non-optimal fashion. So just don't do that, okay? And the funny thing is that young people insist they want to do it. This is a study that came out in 2012 where they looked at 774 students and when they sat in the class, 24.7% were, were in Facebook, 50.6% sent test messages, they sent instant messages, email, listened to music, worked on other classes, talked on the phone and ate and drank. So this is, this is what students do when they sit in a class. Okay. And, um, what happens when you do this? Well, you learn less. And that is uh, what's also shown. So if you open up your laptop when there is a lecture, you multitask because the lecture is one stream of meaning and you create another one with Googling or what, with Facebooking or whatever you do. 
And if you do this, your learning goes down. And they did this in an audience of this big, where they just told half of the people, your laptop stays in your backpack, and the other half could take it out and go on with wireless LAN and multitask. Okay. And then you look, and, and after the lecture, you say, stop, remain seated, we do a multiple choice task uh, on the subjects of this lecture. Okay. And it turns out that people who were allowed to multitask do worse. And we know even more. If you sit in a lecture, take out a pen and a piece of paper. This paper has a wonderful title, The Pen is Mightier Than the Keyboard. What did they do? And in fact, one from Silicon Valley and one from Princeton. And they, and they basically did five experiments where they had students either type along a lecture or write along. And then they tested the students on items of the on the lecture, and they found in all five studies, if you write along, you remember more. Writing is a complicated thing to do, which is when you, and it, it, it's not, you're not so fast. So you have to constantly think: What is the professor saying? Is that interesting? Well, do I know this already, or should I take a note and write it down a bit, just a tiny note, so such I can go through this later on? So that you think a lot when you write. When you type along, particularly if you are fast in typing, you can type just what the professor says. But you don't have to think about what he says when you do that, which is why you don't remember so well. Again, that's not me saying it. You can Google that for yourself. That American scientists found that out. Again, when you Google something or when you read it in a book, and you look afterwards how much got stuck in your, in, in your memory, it turns out that if you Google it, chances are least likely that you memorize it. If you read it from a book, chances are higher that you memorize it. The reason is if you Google something, you know, ah, I can Google this. And your brain doesn't make any, any attempt to memorize it. But you want to memorize things, for example, when you are in school and want to learn something. So using Google at school is not a good idea. It's the worst thing you can do if you want to learn something, is to Google something. Read it in a book, read it in a magazine, read it in a newspaper, much better. Read it in Google, the worst thing. Electronic textbooks, you can read it. That was a science magazine paper. That's one of the most high power science journals that we have on Earth. This is not the Baden-Württemberg Journal on esoteric stuff. No, it's, it's, it's high power science, okay? Same thing here. That's again, came out in Science Magazine. Turns out that if you read an electronic textbook, it's not as good as if you read a paper textbook. Which is why 85% of Californian college students, these are 17 years old from Silicon Valley, 85% of them, if you ask them, what do you read? Paper books, please. And if you send them a PDF, they will print it out and read it as, uh, from the printout. And nobody of them will scan in a paper and read it from a screen. And they, and they, and they say, well, if I read from a screen, it's, it doesn't stick that well. That'll this is Californian students from Silicon Valley. They are supposed to be at the forefront of uh, digital use. Well, they prefer paper because it's better. And then there's another thing. If the textbook makers, the electronic textbook makers say, well, we, we, we just have to use the digital concept right. So we add movies instead of just photographs. And instead of, well, references, we put in hyperlinks. You click on them right there. Wow, if you do this with textbooks, that is, if you enhance them digitally, learning with them goes way down. So the more digitally elaborate the textbook is, the less learning takes place with it. And the simple reason is that reading is good for your education. Clicking is not. And if you do a lot of clicking and during this time frame, not so much reading, learning goes down. It's as simple as that. Which is why the more elaborate an electronic textbook is, the worse the learning outcome is. It's been shown for children's books as well, by the way. Um, electronic children's books is the worst thing you can buy for your kid if you want to have language development. It, 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 you know, they have a read to me button. 
So it's, the, the book reads itself, okay? The problem is kids can't learn language from screens and loudspeakers. They need to be a person. That's, we know this for 15, 20 years. There's just no learning from a screen and a loudspeaker. So a children's book with a read to me button is like a personal home trainer with a little electric motor such that you don't need to use your muscles. That doesn't make any sense because you, the thing is used for using your muscles, okay? Because you, you sit on this, on this um, well, cycle and, um, and you train your muscles and you sweat. It, and that's the point of this. So putting an electric motor and say, well, you know what? I have this motor so you don't have to use your muscles when you run this thing. So no sweat, no... Well, then you wouldn't use it, okay? Same thing with electronic books with a read to me button for kids. You read to kids because of their language development. And an electronic book with a read to me button is not the way kids learn language. So you can just do without it, period. And one should know about these things. Finally, when you are, do, when you are on a journey, you get to many places. Just to talk about these places, just for a moment, and then I'm done. Do you know where this is? This is a landscape picture. Anyone, a any idea? This landscape is from the Saturn moon Titan. But it looks like, you know, a shore and um, a lake. And uh, you wonder, where's the hotel and the beach pub? <laughs> you can't help but doing so because you take, away, you take with you your brain that has evolved dealing with a world that was around there. And what was around there were plants, trees, lakes, rivers, seas, and also there was, sometimes there was a view. And if you had a view, you spotted the lion earlier than those who didn't have a view. And if you have water around when you are thirsty, that's very handy. And if you have plants around, they may carry fruit, that's handy when you're hungry, and they give you shade, that's handy when the sun's shining. What I've just told you is, our preferences for certain landscapes, trees, a view, and water. How do I know that? I just checked the prices of real estate. <laughs> Look at real estate prices. A home with a view, with a lake, and with trees, compared to just the same house without all that, is much more expensive. And that's not a fad in westernized societies, no. That's any place. Because those who didn't care about views, plants, or water, well, they are not our grandparents. But they had been eaten by the lion or they succumbed to uh, thirst or hunger, okay? So it's deeply built into us that we go for nature. When you go in a forest, your stress level goes down. You feel protected, you feel secure, as long as it's not too dark. If it's too dark, it's, it's, it's the opposite. But if it's, it's a, if it's a normal forest, if it's the, the greenery outside, okay, probably you feel it. And if you don't feel it, let me tell you, it's good for you because your stress hormone goes down. And in fact, what they showed is if you have a room like this and they had a couple of hundred people um, do the written examination for their driver's license with and without some plants in the room. If there are plants in the room, more people make the driver's license than if there are no plants in the room. Because if you have a lower stress, uh, your mind works better, which is why you can do your driver's license better. They've shown this. And uh, another nice thing is this. This came out in Science Magazine more than 30 years ago. If you got your gallbladder removed and you hang out in a hospital, 
you're out a day earlier when your hospital windows goes into greenery than onto a gray wall. Because the greenery reduces stress, that makes you, your, your immune system better, it makes everything better that works for your body, which is why you can get out of the hospital a day earlier. That's been shown 30 years ago. And again, natural landscapes, plants, trees, blue and green. And now let me go through a couple of stuff. More green space is linked to less stress, particularly when, they are, when the communities are deprived in the first place. Okay, in, in a very affluent, you have enough greenery. But if you have not so affluent uh, environment and they have a bit of green, they live longer. In Munich, they measured blood pressure in 10-year-old kids and it turns out the blood pressure is the higher, the less greenery is in the neighborhood. In 10-year-old kids, that's important because if you're 10 year old and have hypertension, you suffer all the, all the long-term complications. And if you don't, you don't. If I, I have low blood pressure, if I got high pleasure, blood pressure now, it would, would, wouldn't be too bad. Well, I, I, I die of other things. Be, before I get you know, the complications of high blood pressure, it takes decades. I'm dead anyway. So I needn't worry about high blood pressure, but you need to worry about high blood pressure in a 10 year old. He or she has all the time he or she needs to develop blindness, heart attacks, strokes, um, uh, and other things. If you had a stroke and you live in greenery, recovery is easier. Mental health is better in greener spaces. And um, if you have green space in the neighborhood, again, there's more mental health. If you walk in this area or in this natural area, it turns out that uh, it's, it's better for your emotions, it's better for any measure you can take when you walk it through, through greenery compared to walk in suburban spaces. You actually get more creative when you are in green space. So if you, want to, if, if you have a problem and you just can't figure it out, go out and you'll be able to figure it out. At least chances get more likely that you will work it out. Okay, that's been shown. Um, again, benefits on cognition, and I skip a few of those. Uh, notice they all come from the last two to three years. So the last two to three years saw a lot of studies having clearly, clearly showing that yes, it's good to be out because then you can think better, you live longer, you are more creative. And there's one more thing, you are actually a better person. Because if you, th if you stand under tall trees, you think, oh, this is awe. This is awe-inspiring. And awe means I feel a bit smaller than usual, but I feel at the same time connected with the big nature around me. And this feeling small and feeling connected is something that makes you a more moral person. They have demonstrated this experimentally. You either stand in front of a brick wall or in a forest. And this is a group. And then they say, now let's do a, a, a personality test. And here is the test, and the, you give out, you're given out the leaflet with the uh, questions. And then somebody comes along with a little uh, box with um, uh, pencils for you, that you, because you need them to fill out. So what happens is, he drops the box. And that's actually the experiment, because you, you look at how many people will bow down and help this poor guy who dropped the box getting at the pencils. And it turns out if you do this under trees in nature, people are more helpful. So it's not just that you say, I am more helpful when I'm in nature. No, they are actually more helpful because you tested it because there was somebody needed help, in need of help. And then you look how many people did help him. And more people help in, the, in nature compared to in concrete. So you get, you're a better person even. Actually when you, when you engage in jogging you will be more creative. So now the, uh, the question is, is it when you jog through a forest that, you, that the jogging is good or is the forest good? Is it the motion or is it, well what is it? They figured this out as well. The funniest experiment to, be, to, be, to, be, to do. You not just go sitting in a room and then do a creativity test. 
or jogging in the forest and doing a creativity test. You do two more groups. One is a treadmill inside the room. So you run in the room. The most funny control condition is you sit in a wheelchair and someone pushes you through a forest. <laughs> and then you measure creativity. And it turns out sitting in a room is the worst thing to do when you want to be creative. Walking in the room on a treadmill is not bad. Sitting outside being pushed through a forest is also not bad. But walking or running to, through a forest is the best. Because these are the results of two creativity tests, of a hard one and an easier one. And, um, and you see the, uh, there's a clear pattern here. So it's both nature and walking uh, that makes you more creative. And people actually underestimate the effects. That has been done as well. I ask you, how do you feel right now from zero bad to 100 very good? And people say, oh, 45. And now if you walked outside for an hour, how would you feel? People say, oh, well, maybe 52. And then please go outside and come back and tell me how you feel. People come back and say 78. So they underestimate, and all people do that, underestimate the benefits that they will get from going out. Okay. As a father, I know when I talk to my kids on a Saturday, uh, Sunday afternoon, let's go for a walk. Ugh. <laughs> Sometimes I persuaded my kids that we went for a walk. And believe it or not, when we came back after two or three hours, they were the greatest kids to have. Uh, so it really helps. So to sum up, I have a lot of advice from brain research for your journey through life. That is, you are about to, well, to have a lower rate of synaptic change in your brain, yes. But if you have a already accumulated a lot of knowledge, that doesn't matter because the more you know, the better you will learn on top of that. And again, the brain is never full. It can only be empty if it has never been filled. And you have a hard time making it full if it is empty when you are 25. You can lower stress by community and company. That's a very important thought. We are not a species geared to living alone. We are a species geared to cooperation, fairness, making things together. This is not Wild West capitalism what human beings are made for. There's a lot of social neuroscience now showing this very clearly. That's another talk. But just to make this point very clear, uh, we are not sharks among sharks or wolves among wolves. That's sometimes, sometimes people tell you that human beings are like that. No, we are not. We are quite likable beings and we want to be in good company and we want to do things together. That's what human beings really are. Everyone who will tell you something else probably wants to make money out of you or wants to use you for his purposes or abuse you. And then there is connectedness to nature, which just makes you a better person. A more functioning, higher functioning person, and also a better connected person to you, yourself, nature, and to other people. Which is amazing, because nature is, by definition, well, just nature, not people. But it makes you a better person in terms of dealing with other people. So now you know a bit what brain research can tell you what to do. Of course, there's one thing you have still to do, that is, do it. Nobody can lead your life. Nobody can do your journey. You have to do it. And I hope this talk was helpful to get it, the whole thing to a better end. Thanks for listening for one and a half hours.